justice. Uh, it's disgusting. Uh, this is a very dangerous thing. I think it actually has, uh, uh, you know, it, it continues the downward spiral of our institutions and the people's trust in them. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, that quite frankly, um, I never thought I would ever see in my lifetime. But, uh, you know, we, we've got to stop this. And, you know, the, and Congress has the power to do something about it. It's called defunding. They hold the power of the purse. They need to defund any and all of these types of activities from the DOJ where they are you know, basically using lawfare to go against political uh, opponents. Do you find any validity in any of the charges or indictments, Nate? None whatsoever. And this is, this is absolutely ridiculous. The notion that just because Donald Trump gave a speech where he said, peacefully go, and exercise your First Amendment right, that that is somehow criminal. Think about what that does to the rest of Americans, you know, in, in the country. Basically, they're trying to set a precedent right now that, to, in or, you know, that, that our First Amendment right is now somehow criminal, that right to assemble peaceably to make your grievances known to your government. That's what this is. And then on top of it, they're not just going against Trump, but they're also trying to go after his legal counsel. So what, now you don't have a right to legal counsel? You don't have a right, uh, you know, to, to question a illegal and unconstitutional election? Because that's exactly what happened here. I'll tell you, I'm one of the few that probably have a very, very good understanding of what happened in this election because I was down there in Washington, D.C. after the 2020 election, and I participated in election integrity efforts. So I've got a background, 26 years in cybersecurity, and I was asked to come down and help. And I saw things that were flat out illegal that took place during the election to include what happened in Pennsylvania, where the governor basically completely overrode the, uh, uh, the legislature and decided. And, and it was determined by a court later that that was illegal. So this notion that, uh, that a, a president cannot question uh, an election where there was what, that was rife with cheating and rife with um, you know, violations of the law, including, including the 1968, uh, um, the, uh, uh, not the Voting Rights Act, but the Civil Rights Act, 1968. There's a provision in there required that, that all, any and all records pertinent to voting in an election are required to be maintained for two years. I saw tons of evidence of records that were destroyed, and, uh, you know, where, where they did not keep those records. And in many cases, it was government officials who destroyed them. You cannot conduct an audit if you don't have those records. Bill, so, let's go to you first. Okay. N Nate, you've implied that there's uh, widespread corruption in DOJ. Uh, would you extend that to widespread corruption in a court system? Because our courts uh, invariably found that uh, uh, they ru they've ruled against uh, Trump, at least in the uh, where he's challenging the legitimacy of the election. Absolutely. Our, our courts are corrupt. There's no doubt about it. And I'll tell you how I know that, because there were 57 – uh, cases that were brought before the courts, including the Supreme Court. And in every single case, not one court allowed for an evidentiary hearing. So when you hear the mainstream media touting that, oh, all of this has been debunked, all of, you know, all of the uh, uh, election integrity efforts have been debunked, those are all lies. How can you debunk something if you refuse to even look at it? So, That's the problem here. Okay. So what part of our government is legitimate today? Is there any part legitimate? I'm sure there are certain people that have been elected that are legitimate. I'm not saying that every single elected official is not legitimate. But the problem is, and this is where I'm going with this that really concerns me, I think it was three weeks ago there was a circuit, federal circuit court that uh, came out and said that there was, um, uh, there was FISA 702 used against American citizens illegally over 250,000 times. Think about that number. It came out uh, also there was an IG that said that's happened over a million times. And then just a couple of days ago, there was a report that came out that a sitting senator had one used against him. When you've got that kind of, of uh, spying going on by our own government against the American people, and in this case, sitting senators, sitting congressmen, and sitting judges, you know there's about to be some blackmail there somewhere. So maybe that's why we're seeing some corruption 
like we've never seen before. Oh, like we've never seen before. What about J. Edgar Hoover? Well, J. Edgar Hoover, he absolutely did this. We all know about it. But what we have now, it's like what J. Edgar Hoover did, but on steroids. You're, lo- you're talking about the ability under 702, which is essentially never intended to be used against American citizens. It is illegal to use against American citizens, but they have been doing it, and the court has even said so. But what it allows for them to do is it allows them to have access to 100% of your digital records, anything that they can get to digitally, and that includes on your phone, your social media, your bank accounts, your, uh, uh, you know, basically your, your private messages, your text messages, anything and everything digital. You've got to think about that. You're, you're going you're gonna to find something there that you can put a pressure point. And if you can't find it on them, what 702 allows, it allows the two hop rules so then they can go after your kids, your spouse, your loved ones, whatever. So even if you had a person who is a righteous person in one of these positions, they could probably find somebody in their family that they care about that they could put pressure on. This is a crisis, and Congress needs to do something about it. They cannot allow this to continue. And in fact, 702 is supposed to, uh, it's supposed to end in December, everyone needs to be calling their Congress and calling the representatives and demanding that they allow this thing to expire and do not renew it because it has been abused. And honestly, I think there need to be hearings on this issue. So, Maria? so uh, Nate, good morning. Um, so good morning. a question then, you want to join the fray. I mean, you want to be part of this incredibly corrupt system because I'm guessing you're painting with a broad enough brush that that Congress and maybe Alex Mooney and Senator Capito are also in the the corruption uh, that you're describing. But how do you go in there and change all of that? Well, we, we don't know. That's the problem. We don't know who's been corrupted by this. And yes, you're right. This is not something that I don't, I don't think this is not something that I, I think I want to go into. It's not something that I would want to be put up against. But I can tell you, I had 702 FISA, I'm certain of it, used against me for two years. So, you know, I know what it's like to have that kind of, of, of um, pressure essentially brought on you as a weapon by the DOJ after I blew the whistle. They came after me hard. And the fact is, is that we can't allow this sort of thing to happen. Now, whether or not, you know, who and who is, has been corrupted by it, we don't know. But I do know that there are things that can be done. You know, we can't, there are hearings that can happen, and there, there's defunding that can happen. That is the one power that Congress does, happen, uh, does have. And I had mentioned it, I think, uh, early on in my campaign when I'd been on the show. I mentioned about the Article I tribunal. That is still an option on the table it is a congressional tribunal that can be brought. There already exists one. We've already had, in fact, we've got several of them. Uh, one of them is the U.S. Tax Court. But what it allows for is it allows for the appointment of temporary judges. Judges. These are not uh, permanent judges. But I really do believe we need something outside the current ju- judiciary to adjudicate this issue. Nate Kane, our guest, he is a candidate for Congress and uh, just getting his reaction to the Trump indictments yesterday. Nate, directly related uh, in terms of your campaign, still a long way to go until the West Virginia primary uh, uh, comes up. What is your strategy between now and then? Are you at any point along the way uh, looking to get involved in debates? Absolutely. I would love to be involved in debates. I hope that uh, somebody will put one on and, and uh, you know allow for all of the candidates to participate in it. I think that's a great way to really, you know, get to the bottom of where these people stand on, on different issues. Because obviously when we're out there talking, you know, it's, it's our talking points and the things that we want to say. But when you have a debate, you really have an opportunity, um, you know, to ask a question and to get everyone's response to it. How have you found the fundraising atmosphere to be this year? Well, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, I was just talking with my uh, campaign manager, also my wife, and uh, we've raised uh, thirty thousand uh, dollars by the end of June. I think we've raised about another ten since then, but uh, yeah, it's all been done without holding a single fundraiser. Um, now we need to start doing some fundraisers, and so we're going to start, uh, you know, putting that together. 
Um, but, you know, fundraising is not something I think there's, there's probably few people in this world that like the idea of going around and asking for money. <laughs> and so uh, that is something that I need help with. And so if anybody's listening and they want to help with my campaign, uh, they can go to my, my uh, campaign web, website at uh, Nakane for WV.com. There's a link on there where they can donate to my campaign. But my strategy in, in, uh, in this election is primarily focused on grassroots and getting out there and actually talking to the people. I think that is the most important thing that somebody who's wanting to represent the people needs to be doing is actually going out and talking to them, listening to them, hearing their concerns, finding out what they need, finding out what, what the issues are for them. And what I'm finding is that in West Virginia, you've got different regions where you have regional issues that are very specific to them. And then you've got issues that are national you know, issues that matter to all Americans and, and especially matter to all people in West Virginia. Are you making any appearances in person in the near future in the Eastern Panhandle, Nate? Uh, yes. Uh, let me see if I can look at my schedule. But, yeah, we do have something. Uh, the best thing to do is go to my website uh, where they can find uh, what our schedule is up on there of upcoming events. But we do have uh, some things planned out there. I think that we're going to be uh, out at the youth fair uh, that's upcoming. Um, we're also going to be um, trying to get in on the next meeting that they have with the uh, uh, Berkeley County uh, um uh, the Berkeley County Business Group up there, also the uh, Berkeley County Republicans Club. Uh, we've been out there a few times, and, and we'll be out there again. And uh, so there's some other opportunities that are coming up. But yeah, we're we're all over the place. So I mean, we we campaigned in 18 counties in uh, in June, and then in July I think we hit something like 14, and uh, we put over 30,000 miles on our car in the last three months. So it's been quite an adventure. Thankfully, uh, like I said, my campaign manager is my wife, so we're going to spend a lot of time together. And uh, it's actually been uh, quite a rewarding experience going out there and talking to people. Bill, do you have a final question for Nate? Well, it's kind of looking down the stream. Uh, as we've talked before, Nate, you've got a real uphill battle to run, uh, both in terms of name re- name recognition and dollars, because uh, uh, your opponent, uh, your principal opponent, has a lot of money coming in. Uh, but you have a lot of passion. You have a lot of drive. Uh, should it not go your way, what is going to be next in line uh, for Nate? after the election well you know i i got into this race um really because i was praying and asking god to raise up righteous men and women and i felt like the lord challenged me on that and said well what about you and uh so i'm doing this out of obedience to him and if i don't win then my next step is to ask him okay god what now <laughs> and so you know obviously i have a i have a uh, my own business and uh but i can tell you one thing that has changed permanently no matter what um, regardless of what happens in this election, I'm going to be involved in West Virginia politics in one way or another, uh, either as an activist and and pushing for things uh, that I believe in and, and making noise and getting out there and talking to folks. I've made so many really close uh, just uh, relationships and friendships with people all over the northern half of the state, and, never, and that's never going to go away. Um, so it, whether I wanted to or not, I'm in this game now, you know, probably – uh, you know, for the rest of my life. And so um, it is, a, it's an exciting opportunity, you know, to, to be, you know, be able to just go around and talk to people and meet people from all over and make those relationships. So um, no matter what, I, I will be involved in one way or another. Nate, thanks so much for your time this morning. As always, greatly appreciated. Thank you. God bless. Nate Kane at 833 in a segment brought to you